After 4,000 public presentations, Frank Maselli has mastered the secrets of delivering super effective presentations. He will share many of these techniques with you today during the webinar. In your webinar console, you should see a box marked questions. If you have a question, please type it in the box and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Thank you for attending and I'll turn it over to Frank. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. I appreciate it. I, I assume everyone can hear me and see me. Let me just make sure. Oh, good. Okay. Seems to be working. Um, I, I assume you're also seeing the screen. I'm, I'm always mystified and amazed when these things actually work, so p pardon my, uh, my confusion here. But, but thank you for joining us, and I think we're going to have some fun. And, and let me just say at the outset, I know that webinars can be very difficult for the, for the participants. Sitting there, you know, you're sitting at your desk or you're sitting in a conference room and you're listening to some disembodied voice and it can be quite tiresome and tedious. I'll try to make this as exciting for you as I can and, and I promise you there's some value in here. So uh, we, we've condensed down a multi-day training program into some very uh, essential points that will help you tremendously if you're doing workshops and seminars. And uh, I, I guarantee you that if you use some of the techniques we discuss, they will make a difference for you. And, and when I say make a difference, I, I mean that in a business context. I, I believe the ultimate goal of a workshop or a seminar is, to, is for you to reach out and build new relationships with clients. It's, it's wonderful to educate. It's wonderful to teach. It's wonderful to, you know, to share your wisdom with the public. But at the end of the day, this is about you building new relationships. And, and I think that's the most important thing to understand. And I'm sure you completely understand that. So it's a moot point. So let, let me get into this. Let's have some fun and we'll see where we go and we'll have some time for questions and, and I, I'll try to help you as much as I can. I've made, I've probably made every possible mistake that a human being can make in the seminar world. I have done quite a few of these things as Lauren told you. And I've trained thousands of advisors, so I pretty much have seen almost everything being done in the financial services profession in the context of workshops and seminars. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can give you some guidance that'll help. So the title is Seven Steps to Super Workshops. Um, uh, very briefly, my background, uh, ex-Army officer, 36 years in the business. I started as a financial advisor with a company called Dean Witter. Uh, brokerage firm, which was owned by Sears, if, if any of you go back that far, that's quite a long ways ago. I became an executive manager, ran a mutual fund family up in Boston, uh, written a few books, and, and now I am uh, on the staff, if you will, or, or part of the faculty of White Glove, which I'm guessing you're all familiar with, and, and if you're not, you, you probably should be. White Glove is a, is a f fantastic organization that has completely... Um, revolutionized the marketing process for workshops and seminars. And uh, I'm not going to do a White Glove commercial, but if you don't know White Glove, uh, the, the, you really should get to know them at some point. So that's a good thing. So uh, anyway, all right, good. So here we go. Let, let me set the stage with the big picture very briefly. I think we have an historic opportunity right now in our profession. And I'll just give you the short version of this for just a minute, just some very simple numbers. We have 77 million retiring baby boomers, and, and you're all very familiar and comfortable with the baby boomers. You, you know, our industry has been working with the baby boomers for 25 years. They're the sweet spot in our client base. So you understand the boomers very well. They are very concerned about retirement. They're very interested in learning more. They're panic-stricken about having enough assets and, and outliving their money. So you all understand that. But following the boomers, this is interesting. Following the boomers, we've got 41 million very worried Gen Xers. And when I say worried, what they're mostly worried about is that there's going to be nothing left for them by the time they retire because the boomers will have taken Social Security out to the cleaners. So Gen Xers are coming out of the woodwork for workshops and seminars to learn what they can do to protect themselves in retirement. And they're actually very good investors. They save and invest more money as a percent of disposable income than any other generation because of what they've seen in their lifetimes. Very self-sufficient generation, important to understand. But then it gets even better because you've got 83 million maturing millennials. And when I say maturing millennials, I'm talking about millennials turning 40, 41, 42 years old. 
The millennial generation, which is the, in fact now the largest generation born anywhere in America in history, the millennials are reaching peak earning and peak investing phase. They are a fantastic emerging client base, and we are seeing many millennials coming to workshops to learn the techniques and the skills necessary to succeed as investors and savers and plan for their own retirement. What this basically means is that right now in America today, as a financial advisor, there are 201 million people who need your help, and they love educational events. The future of our profession, ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, having done this for a long time, okay, the future is educational events. Sales pitch is over. Arm twisting is over. Heavy-handed, you know, conversations, the old Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross model, those days are gone. We need to help people, and we've got an amazing opportunity to do that. And I'm guessing uh, the, the fact that you're on this call today, you recognize some of this. So the numbers are staggering. The future for our profession is so bright that it's hard to get your mind around it. You couldn't pick a better place to be at a better time. So congratulations. So let's assume for the sake of argument for today, just to keep things simple, let's assume that you're already a pretty good speaker, okay? Let's assume that you're comfortable in front of a room, that you're not, you know, tripping over yourself or terrified or, you know, shivering in the corner. We, we, many people do have a fear of public speaking. We can address that. But, but for the sake of argument, let's just say you're pretty good in front of a room full of people. And let's also say that you're genuinely likable. Likeability is a very difficult thing uh, to coach. Um, it's one of the most challenging things I try to do. But I'm going to assume that you're, you're a likable person, you're, you're pleasant to be around, and people can sense that. So now the question is, what do you do from here? You've got, you've got the raw makings of a good presenter. Now what? Well, first step is to master the basics of a great workshop. I'm going to blast through this very quickly. And, and by the way, if any of you want a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, just get in touch with Lauren, and, and she can make this available to you so you don't have to take you know, frantic notes while we're talking here. The basics of workshops. Let me cover them very quickly. Basic workshop rules. Number one, know your material cold. You've got to be completely comfortable with what you're talking about. I think that there, there's some obvious reasons for that. You're supposed to be an expert. And, you know, if you're tripping over yourself and trying, trying to figure out what to say next, it undermines your credibility. So you don't want to do that. But, but the biggest reason to know your material cold is because you as the speaker want to focus on the audience. You want the majority of your touch, your, the majority of your attention, not to be on the slideshow, but to be on the audience. The audience is going to tell you a lot of things. They're going to tell you if you're going too fast, too slow, if they understand you, if they're bonding to you in some way. So you don't want to be staring at the screen wondering what to say next. You want to be staring at the audience and connecting with them. So you've got to be very comfortable with your material. That's number one. Number two, Arrive 90 minutes early. 90 minutes gives you enough time to correct anything that's wrong. And, and if any of you have done more than two workshops, you know that there's a million things that can go wrong. The room is set up incorrectly. There's no tables. Uh, the place is messy. The, the, you know, there's, uh, there's light coming in that you can't block out. There's too much noise in the other room. There's a million things that could go wrong. And if you're just showing up five minutes before start time, you have no time to correct these things. So get there early, be prepared. And if you can't get there early, have someone from your staff get there. Make sure you've got somebody really good taking care of the logistics for you. And by the way, White Glove takes care of most of all of that for you, so that's a good thing. Number three, begin and end on time. This is a very simple sign of respect for the audience. Beginning on time, ending on time, respects their time. They've invested a very precious commodity with you, which is time, okay? Time, in many cases, is more important than money to these people. So starting late sends the wrong message, and ending late or dragging it out too long violates a very fundamental principle of presenting, which is always leave them wanting more. It's very possible that you'll get in a, you know, you'll get in a real groove. You'll be moving along really well. The audience is with you. And the temptation to extend the workshop 10, 20, 30 minutes is there because you're really having fun and they seem to be having fun. And that's a big mistake. You want to end on time. And if, and if there's enough passion to stick around, then fine, stick around. But some people have to get home. They've got a babysitter or whatever. It's a sign of respect. You understand this. 
Number four, look and act professionally. Uh, I'm not going to go into the whole dress for success discussion here. All I can say is this, and, and I say this for an important reason. I'm noticing an interesting counter trend right now in our profession. I'm noticing a lot of financial professionals giving workshops and dressing, in my opinion, very casually. And I would say casual is no jacket and tie. And there's a temptation, and I understand this, and maybe it's a generational thing that, you know, everybody watches TED Talks and they come out in, you know, pajamas, it seems like sometimes. But, but, but bottom line is you're a financial professional, and I think you have to look the part of a professional. I, for men, I say jacket and tie is a bare minimum. Um, if you want to get casual during the workshop, you can always take off the jacket. You can always undo the tie. You can roll up the sleeves. You can go from casual to formal. You cannot go from, I'm sorry, you, 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 you can go from formal to casual. You cannot go from casual back to formal, okay? Now, some of you will tell me, Frank, I've got a very rural audience. They would be, you know, put off if I came in a suit and tie. Well, fine, okay. Tone it down if you have to, but look like a professional and act like a professional. I, I don't have time to explain that one to you. That's a very... That's a very subtle discussion, but suffice to say that the audience is watching you and paying attention to everything you do before you ever say a word to that crowd, before you even step up in front of the room. So monitor closely your behavior both before and after a workshop because the audience is monitoring you very carefully. And I could tell you a horror story about that if we had time, but we'll save that for the sake of for simplicity. So number four, look and act professionally. And, and by the way, women, um, I don't have any advice for women on how to dress. I, I, and I wouldn't presume to give you advice, but there's probably some equivalent of a suit and tie for women. So, you know, think about that and, and give it some thought. Number five, number five, make your guests comfortable. Comfort is an extremely important quality in a workshop. You want, number one, to always, always use tables in a workshop. Don't ever do theater style seating. Theater style seating is chairs only. And it's the worst thing you could do. So if you're faced with a conundrum where there's only chairs, find another location or get there early enough to have the place set up tables for you. Tables give people 17 extra seating positions, which makes them very comfortable. And then on a, sub on a subliminal level, a table gives the audience a barrier that protects them from you. Also, a table gives them a place to put their notes, their handouts, their coffee, their soda, whatever you've given them as a, as a snack. And by the way, always have snacks at your workshop. And, I, and we're not talking anymore about dinner and lunch workshops. Obviously, if you're having a dinner seminar, you're going to have a table. But even if you're doing purely educational events at colleges or high schools or community centers, you want to have tables and you definitely want to have refreshments. These people are guests in your home and you want to treat them very well and you want to make them comfortable. Comfort also speaks into things like temperature, um, room design, lighting, audio. There's, there's some subtle points to this that we go into in the book in excruciating detail. So comfort is very important. People like to be comfortable. Okay, I'm going fast. Are you, st are you still with me? I haven't seen anybody drop out yet. So that's a good sign. Okay, here we go. Number six, keep it simple. Um, Simplicity is important, and, and some of these workshops can get a little complicated. They can get a little deep into the weeds, and you know what I'm talking about if you've done any of these. Some of these can go really, really detail-oriented and very numerical and statistical. Keep in mind, the audience can only absorb a certain amount of heavy-duty content. So if your seminar has a lot of content in it, it's good to occasionally bring people back up to the big picture. And when I say big picture, the question I constantly ask the audience, and I'll stop myself and I'll say, folks, why are we talking about this? Why am I discussing the detailed rules of Social Security withdrawals? Why are we talking about this? What's the big picture reason for this? Audiences love it when you go back up to the big picture because they understand big picture. They do not understand details. It's shocking to me how little Americans know about money. And I'm guessing you've been around long enough to realize that people just do not understand what's happening in the world of money. So the deeper you go, the more risk there is of losing people during that workshop. Now, I'm not saying you simplify the whole thing. There have to be elements in the workshop that do go deep and cover detail. 
But ultimately, you've got to bring them always back up to the big picture and help them understand stuff. Number seven, prepare for tech failure. Things can go wrong. Your computer could die. PowerPoint could crap out on you. The screen could die. There's a million things that could go wrong. So be prepared to deliver the workshop without technology. Now, that's a challenging thing, and I don't have time to go into great detail on that. I would have some handouts prepared if necessary, and I would also be prepared to deliver the workshop on a whiteboard to have visuals. People love visuals. 70% of Americans are primary visual learners. That means they've got to see something while you're talking to them. So just getting up in front of an audience and talking is not effective. And I know a lot of advisors tell me, Frank, I don't use PowerPoint. I don't use anything. I just talk. Well, okay, you, you got my attention for about 10 minutes when you're just up there talking. But for the course of an entire hour, if you don't give me something to look at, then you're going to lose my attention very quickly and I'm not going to stay with you. So prepare for tech failure. Never pitch products of any kind. Number eight, there's only one product you ever have to sell to a fellow human being and that's yourself. And as soon as you put a product into that workshop, you know, a mutual fund, an annuity, an ETF, a money management strategy, as soon as you start talking product, you cut your appointment ratio by 70% because the audience knows for sure that what's going to happen to them on the appointment is they're going to get the product. Somebody's going to pitch them that product. So never pitch products, talk generically, talk conceptually, never pitch a product. Very important. Number nine, follow up immediately. We set appointments right at the workshop. Uh, big believer in striking while the iron is hot. They will never be more ready to set an appointment than they are right there at the workshop. And we'll teach you how to do that. And number 10, number 10 is interesting. Have some fun. The audience wants to see you enjoying yourself in front of the room. If you're up there struggling, if you're up there sweating and, you know, just going through hell, th th that's an uncomfortable experience for the audience, okay? And, and if, if workshops are not fun for you, the, well, the first question is I would say, well, why are you doing them? And I, but I understand you want to grow, and, and that's fine. But if they're not fun, let's figure out how to make them fun because – Public speaking can be one of the greatest exciting joys of your life if you do it well. And, and there's a very high probability that many of you enjoy this and you've gotten that psychic gratification. So let the audience see you having fun, laugh a little bit, and enjoy yourself up in front of the room and let them know that you love doing these workshops. I think that makes some sense. Okay. Now, these are the basics. Uh, let's assume that you've mastered the basics. Now what? I got that. What else? Well, now we're going to talk about some advanced stuff very quickly, and I think this is where we'll differentiate you from your competition because, folks, make no mistake, there's competition out there. And by the way, you want competition. Uh, I hear a lot of advisors say, Frank, my, my market has a lot of seminars, and my answer is fantastic. That's exactly what you want. You want to be in a heavily seminared market because what that means is a lot of people are coming out to these things. And what you're going to do is you're going to distinguish yourself by excellence. The vast majority of workshops being done out there are extremely weak. They're mediocre sales pitches. And when you become excellent, you leapfrog the competition in your marketplace. So the more seminars and workshops being done in your market, the more I like it and the more you can begin to own that marketplace. Be the saturator is my answer. So seven advanced techniques. Number one is do a power opening. What is a power opening? Well, let me, let me cover all seven very quickly. Do a power opening, tell impact stories, expand your use of humor, run a great Q&A session. Talk about that in a second, very important. Number five, do an effective commercial. And, and that's important. You've earned the right to do a commercial, but you need to do a good commercial. And by the way, the entire workshop um, cannot be a sales pitch about you. Very important. Number six, do a power close. I'll explain that. And number seven, master the emotional dynamic. I, the, the, the subtitle of my book is Seminars, the Emotional Dynamic. Okay, advanced presentation skills. The emotional dynamic is a set of nine critical emotions that you have to hit during a workshop. And if you hit all nine of them, the people in that room will trip over themselves to become clients. They will fight to set an appointment with you.
Okay, it's that powerful. If you miss any of the nine, you will reduce your effectiveness, and if you're down to one or two, you, you'll be lucky to get a handful of appointments at all. But mastering the emotional dynamic is a very advanced technique. I'm going to touch on it, and if you want to learn more, you can get the book, and I think it'll help you. Okay, so power opening. Why a power opening? A power opening grabs the audience, gets them excited, makes you look different, and sets the tone for the entire event. A power opening is different from what most advisors do, which goes something like this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for coming tonight. Really appreciate your being here. Before we get started on the workshop tonight, I want to tell you a little bit about me and what the Maselli Group can do for you. What you just did was a disaster. What you just did was you bored the heck out of them and you front-loaded front the commercial. You basically said, Folks, before I give you any wisdom or value or insight, I'm going to do a commercial about myself. What, what a horrible thing to do. And I will tell you, 90% of advisors do it, and it's very upsetting to me. And I just think we need to break that habit. The first two minutes of the workshop are an extremely important time because the audience is excited. They're just getting into it. And now you're going to do something different. I've got two examples. You can find these on YouTube. Um, or you can track them down through White Glove. They're on the website. They're on my website. They're everywhere, okay? One is called the Never Before Opening, and one is called the Dollar Bill Opening. They're both pretty dramatic. They're a lot of fun to do. And I do the opening before I even say good evening. I come up, I take the stage, I do a power opening, and then I will go into a little bit about myself. And, again, very little because you don't front load the commercial, put the commercial toward the end. So a little bit then give them value for 45 minutes, then do the commercial. Check out the Never Before opening. It's a great one to do with any retirement-oriented workshop. And the dollar bill opening is a great one to do, especially if you're doing a tax-related workshop. Taxes and retirement is one of the great workshops we're doing. This is a fantastic way to have fun with the audience where you actually rip up a dollar bill. And, and, and some people say, well, Frank, I don't want to rip up a dollar. Fine, rip up a monopoly dollar, rip up a fake million dollar bill. But the drama of ripping something up and saying the IRS gets a piece of your 401k, the IRS wants a piece of your required minimum distributions, the, you know, you're just trashing the IRS every time you rip up that dollar and then you leave them in a tiny little corner and they go, oh, my God, what's left? And, and that sets a dramatic tone for the event. Okay, oh, I'm going at warp speed here. Stay with me. Tell impact stories. Now, stories are a very important part of every workshop, and I think you understand this intuitively. Stories come in many, many forms, and, and I don't have time to explain all the different types of stories. Let me just say, what is an impact story? An impact story is authentic and relevant to the audience. And, and I want to stress relevance for a minute because relevance is the most important part of a story. I am seeing a trend out there in advisor land right now where advisors get up and tell a story that has absolutely no connection to the presentation or the audience. I heard someone start to tell a story about when I was seven years old, I wanted to be a baseball player, and they go into this long-winded childlike explanation of their own personal hopes and dreams. And I'm thinking, what, why? Why are you telling me this? I mean, as a native New Yorker, if I'm sitting in the audience and you start telling me a story about when you were seven years old, my first reaction is, who cares? I came to learn something that's going to help me in retirement. I don't need to hear about your story as a baseball player, okay, in Little League. It's ridiculous. So if you're going to tell a story, make it meaningful to the audience. Now, there are ways to connect personal stories to the discussion of the workshop. That's great. Your personal why story is a classic example of that. A why story is why did you become a financial advisor? And if you've got a good why story, then by all means, learn how to tell it well and be, be great at using it because audiences love why stories. But again, those are relevant and they're tre tremendously authentic. Stories take people on an emotional journey. So you've got to assess the emotional content of your story. And you've got to ask yourself, what is the moral of this story? Why am I telling people this story? If, and if you can't come up with a clear moral, then don't tell the story or sharpen it up so that the moral is clear. Do not make the audience struggle to understand what the reason is for the story. Why is he telling me this story? And if they have to ask themselves that question, then you miss the mark on the story. Not self-serving or trivial. 
And you want to inspire something with your story, some sort of action or revelation so that the audience says, wow, okay, I didn't understand that before. Or, or better yet, yeah, I better do something about that. Again, the ultimate goal being action. All right, so stories are critical. Let me, let me make a suggestion to you. If you want to, if you've got some stories that you use in your workshops and you want to try them out, call me, or email me, whatever. Let's do a story review. I'm more than happy to listen to your story. You can record it. You can send it to me. I'd be very pleased to give you a story analysis. It's totally free. I'm happy to help with this. I love listening to stories. And maybe I can help you sharpen it up, focus it, drill down, make it more dramatic, more exciting in some way, or you know, maybe throw in some humor in, 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 in some way. I think it could be very useful for you, and it's a free service, so you should take advantage of it. I've heard literally thousands and thousands of great stories, and I can really help you polish up your story. Okay, use more humor. Humor is an essential element to a successful workshop. It relaxes people. It helps them remember things. I remember doing workshops 25, 30 years ago, um, and it was a very large meeting, probably about 1,200 people in the room. And I told, I told this story. It was a very funny story. 20 years later, somebody came up to you at a conference and recited the entire story to me. They remembered the entire thing. Humor has a way of penetrating. It has a way of clarifying, and it has a way of really helping people focus, and it's a very memorable moment. So humor is a great thing. It makes the event more fun, gets the audience engaged, makes you seem a lot more friendly, and it is often seen by the audience as a sign of intelligence. Now, the, there's a downside to humor, okay? The, humor is not easy to master. It's subjective and it's variable. Variable means that what worked one night might not work the next night, which is extremely frustrating. Uh, you might have a great story or a great you know, set of humor pieces that you use, and you think, oh, my God, this is great. I'm going to use it again. And the next night it just falls flat as a, as a brick, okay? That's a challenge with humor. It really is, and you have to be prepared for that. Stay away from jokes at all costs. I never tell jokes at a workshop, and there are all these books out there about joke telling and, you know, what kinds of jokes should speakers use. My favorite is zero. Never use a joke. Jokes are terrible. They look canned. They look overly prepared for. And the best part is there's only five people in the entire world that know how to tell a joke, and you're not one of them, okay? So just take my word on that. So never use canned jokes like that, in my opinion. The important thing about humor is to learn your natural style. One of the most uncomfortable things for an audience is to have somebody who's not naturally funny trying to be hysterical. The, the audience would rather you not do that. It just makes them very you know, squirmy in their chairs. So what we try to help you do is figure out what your natural humor style is and tap into that. And, and this is important. If you're not funny, I mean, if you can genuinely say, Frank, I'm not a funny guy. I really like to focus on the numbers. And, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of a Mr. Spock in front of the room. My suggestion is go with that. That can actually be very funny. An audience can find that very endearing. And there's a procedure. We, there's, a, there's a process that we use. If you're not funny, there's some things that you can do to make that enjoyable for the audience. Um, and, and so don't think you got to be Robin Williams, you know, rest his soul, in front of the audience. You don't have to do that. This is not comedy club. Your natural style is a very comfortable style for you. That's what the audience will bond to, but you've got to figure out what your style is. Maybe augment it a little bit. Maybe train it a little bit. Humor is very difficult, but it can be learned. Um, so important to do. All right. And if you're really stuck on humor, there's a fallback called self-deprecation. It's the safest form of humor where you can laugh at yourself. It's highly endearing, and you can pick on something fun or obvious. Usually, I'll pick on my own, you know, my own foibles. You know, I'm a little overweight, like 180 pounds overweight, so I talk about that. It's an obvious thing in front of the room. You can't hide it. Uh, I talk about being obnoxious from New York. People get a kick out of it. You know, you don't want to do it too much. Too frequent is not bad. Again, you don't want to downplay anything about your skill or your professionalism. But I don't make it business-related. I make it personal, and it's a lot of fun. Okay, enough about humor. Let me talk quickly about the Q&A. Run a great Q&A. 
Uh, let me just check the time really fast. Okay, good. We're doing good. Um, and actually, we've gained people, so that's a miracle. What a, what a wonderful thing. A Q&A session is a controversial thing, but I think it's your chance to really shine. I say controversial because a lot of firms have told their advisors, don't do a Q&A. Save, save the questions for the appointment. Well, a good Q&A will double your appointment ratio. You'll get more appointments and you'll get better appointments if you know how to do a good Q&A. I just wrote a complete white paper on all the details of a good Q&A, and I did a podcast on this, so you can access all this stuff. But a great Q&A does a few things for you. First of all, audiences love a chance to ask questions. They, they think it's their right to ask questions, number one. Number two, it cements and enhances your credibility as an expert. When you get up in front of the room, whether you like it or not, you're an expert in the mind of the audience. You're purporting to be an expert or you wouldn't even be up there talking, okay? Experts love questions. They, they welcome an opportunity to handle questions. And when you say to the audience that we're not gonna take questions tonight, they go, huh, maybe this guy really doesn't know what he's talking about. Maybe he's just reading from the slides. That's important. So if you really want to enhance your expertise and credibility, be prepared to do a good Q&A. Makes you look like an expert. It increases the chances for audience interaction, which is very good. Um, the basics of the Q&A, you need to keep it tight and focused. I do five to seven minutes. I set the rules. We don't talk about anything personal, and they've got to stay on topic. And if as, as soon as they violate those rules, I defer the question. Just because you're doing a Q&A doesn't mean you have to answer every question, okay? Um, you, can, you can kick a question out and say, listen, see me after class. We'll talk about that later. I want to stay on topic, or that's a personal issue. See me after class. That's fine. Five to seven minutes. More complex questions require an appointment. I don't get into details on any specific thing. I never give out detailed financial advice at a workshop for obvious reasons. I think you know that. So... Uh, you know, again, set the appointment. And this is important. Never end the workshop on the Q&A. The Q&A comes toward the end, but not at the end of the workshop. And in the white paper, we explain all this and the timing and the complete workshop schedule. What, what's a workshop agenda look like? What does the ideal workshop agenda look like? And we'll explain that. But the Q&A comes before the commercial. It comes before the power close. Uh, and that's the that's just a picture of the white paper, and there's the audio podcast. So you can track all that down. Uh, let's talk about a commercial. Need to do a strong commercial. A commercial basically answers a few questions. Who are you? What do you do? Now, that may be obvious to you, but it's not obvious to the audience, all right? Um, the audience, by the way, has no clue what you do, and they think all financial advisors are the same, which is an interesting reality, and we know that that's not true. So if you do have some distinguishing characteristics, include those in your in your commercial and and you probably understand this as well as I do uh, one of the things that a lot of people talk about nowadays is the concept of fiduciary if you are a fiduciary that is a selling point that is an interesting concept to discuss with an audience even though they have no idea what a fiduciary is it's nice to say it because a lot of the media is telling the public that they better get an advisor who's a fiduciary so if you are one that's an enhancement. If you're not one, then, then maybe you need to be prepared to explain that to some degree um, because the media is pounding that word fiduciary. Um, why do you do what you do? And this is a good place for your why story. People like to hear a why story. How are you different from other advisors or other advisory firms? If there are some things you specialize in or if there are some things that you are uniquely qualified to do, talk about that in the commercial. And then why should I care? That's the ultimate question that the audience is asking themselves as you're talking about yourself. Why do I care about this? So relate it all back to them. Why is it important to you that I'm a fiduciary? Why is it important to you that I'm a specialist in retirement income planning? Why is that critical? Well, and, and you have an answer for that, I assume. So, you know, put that answer in there. Very simple commercial. Who, what, why, how, and why again at the end. If you want to test your commercial out on me, that's a good thing to do. Uh, don't do what Tommy Boy did, which is just wing it. All right, Your commercial is an extremely important part of the workshop. It comes toward the end of the workshop after 
you've given a lot of value after you've earned the right to do a commercial, but test it out on me. Let me hear your commercial. I'm happy to listen to it. We'll polish it up. We'll tighten it up, and we'll make sure it sings. Very important. Do a power close. A power close is the bookend to the power opening, and there are two parts to the power close. The first part is the appointment close, which is, you know, where you maximize the number and quality of appointments. And the second part is very simple. It's an emotional close where you leave people feeling great about themselves and about you. These two come at the end of the workshop. This is the effective end of a workshop. This comes after the Q&A, okay? You wrap up the Q&A, you go into the appointment close and the commercial, you wrap up with the emotional close. There's a very specific set of things to do in the appointment close. The appointment close is designed, oh, and by the way, three minutes for the appointment close, two minutes for the emotional close. So the entire power close is about, two min is about five minutes at the end of the workshop. The appointment close does a few things. You're going to talk about the appointment logistics. You're going to give them something to look forward to when they come in for the appointment, and you're going to make it very easy for them to say yes to the appointment right there at the workshop. You want to set appointments right at the workshop, and there are many mechanical structures for doing this. I use an appointment card. Some people use an evaluation form. Some people use the post-it note thing in the back of the room. Wh whatever the mechanics are that you choose, the effect is basically the same. The effect is to say to the audience, tonight's the night you need to set the appointment, and there's a lot of emotion that goes into this. And when you read about the appointment close, you'll understand some of the emotions that we talk about. So why set appointments at the workshop? Very simple. Audiences cool off very quickly. Within about an hour of the workshop, I would say probably 75% of the intensity of the passion of that workshop has faded. You wait a couple of days after the workshop, and they forgot they even went to a workshop. So you cannot wait. You need to strike while they're ready. And the nice thing is you've given them real value. You've done something really good in front of that room, and you've earned the right to do an appointment close. Folks, this is important. The appointment is to help them. This is not for you. Okay, now look, we understand we're trying to build new relationships. We're trying to build our business. But what's the point of building a new relationship? What's the point of bringing a client on board? The point is to help you help them. And, and I have a very long-winded explanation of this. I use a metaphor called financial lifeguard, and I'm not going to get into that with you. But I think we're here to help people, and I'm, I'm, I think you believe that. Okay, I think in your heart you understand that we're the greatest helper profession in the world. So I'm not asking them to set an appointment for my benefit. I'm asking them so that I can save their family's financial future. And, and so I'm going to be a little bit assertive. I cannot save a family's financial future until they become clients. I need you in the lifeboat. The, the, metaphorically, listen to me here, metaphorically, a, a workshop is you rowing your lifeboat into a sea of drowning people. You're dropping a ladder in the water, and for 45 minutes you are begging them to get aboard the lifeboat. Okay? <laughs> Some of them will come on, and, you know, the better job you do in the workshop, you'll get a 50, 60, 70% appointment ratio, which is fantastic, which is where you need to be. But, but some of them will fight you, okay? They'll fight you because they think you're trying to sell them something. You're not. This isn't about selling stuff anymore. Forget selling. We're not in a sales business anymore. Those days are gone. We're in a helper business. And the more people you help, the better it is for them, the better it is for you. You understand. I, I have to apologize. I get, I get very religious about this, and I, I don't want to go off the deep end. I've only got a few more minutes. So anyway, you understand this. We're here to save lives. They need to become clients. Let me, let me just conclude with the emotional dynamic here. This is a picture of a great guy named Carl Jung, and I'm guessing some of you know who this is. Great student of Freud, one of the world's great psychoanalysts, Jungian analysts. Um, he said something important. He said, emotion is the chief source of all becoming conscious. There can be no transforming of darkness into light or of apathy into movement without emotion, meaning you cannot get somebody to pay attention to something, and you can't get somebody to take action on something until what? Until you get their emotions involved. There are nine emotions that you have to hit during a workshop, and that's what this entire emotional dynamic is all about. And, and this is a best-selling book. It's in its fourth edition. Uh, if you work with White Glove, the book is free. So just, you know, 
ask your white glove success coach for a copy of the book. They'll send you a PDF of it. It's, it's really easy to do. What are the nine emotions? Very quickly, I, I know you're patient. I don't want to go through another laundry list, but I'll cover these fast for you. Number one is you've got to get people to like you. And there are many techniques for this, setting the room up comfortably, providing some snacks and refreshments, all good, temperature, lighting, all that stuff is good, being friendly in front of the room, nice, they like you. Plus, the most important one is giving them genuine value. You give them genuine value, they like you. You sell them stuff, they don't like you, okay? It's that simple. So that's number one. Number two, understanding. People want to understand stuff. They don't want to be baffled. They don't want to be confused. They want to walk out of your workshop going, wow, I understand that now. For the first time, I understand how Social Security works. I understand how taxation of dividends works. You, you can really open up you know, you can turn on that light bulb. And if you can turn on the light bulb and attach that light bulb to your face in some way, if they make that connection between understanding and you, that's a tremendous bond that you've built with that audience. Number three is respect. You need to generate respect in front of the room. And that's one of the great things the power opening does for you is it really says to the audience, wow, this guy's incredible. Uh, and, and that's a wonderful moment when that happens because the audience loves that. Number four is confidence. You want them to be confident in you, but you also want them to be more self-confident. You're going to give them confidence in themselves, and that's one of the things you do with the emotional close. Number five is happiness. You want to have a great time. You want to entertain. A good chunk of a workshop is entertainment, and I, I know that sounds a little crazy, but, but there are things you can do. There are games you can play. I play a really fun game called The Price Was Right which is like a description of inflation. I have pictures of things from 1983. What did they cost in 83? What do they cost today? What's the inflation rate? And boy, you take people back in time and you, you show them some stuff. What did you pay for your first car? Boom, I throw a Toyota Corolla from 1983 on the board. Well, what, you paid $3,000. What is it today? It's $47,000. What's that inflation rate? So th those kinds of games can be a lot of fun. There are many other examples. Got to have a good time. Don't be boring. Number six is fear. Now, fear is important. Understand this. I don't use fear to scare people. I use fear in a workshop to dissipate the fear. What I want to do as the speaker is I want to understand fear, I want to unify the fear, and then I want to dissipate the fear. We call that creating the dragon and slaying the dragon. Do not do not scare people at a workshop. Well, first of all, it's unethical in my opinion. Secondly, you don't have to scare them. They're already scared, okay? People are coming into workshops because they want to know how to survive. They're concerned about their future. So you don't have to scare them more. What you have to do is unscare them throughout the course of the workshop, and then something interesting happens psychologically. The workshop becomes a metaphor for the relationship. If you can unscare them, during the workshop, they will perceive that you will take the fear of retirement or the fear of whatever away as their advisor. Very, very important subliminal psychology, but critical. Action. I want people to take action. I'm going to issue a call to action, very simple action language, and change. I want them to make changes. Action and change are both extremely emotional, and, and you know, the book will teach you more about how to do this. I want them to get comfortable with change. People don't like change. They would rather stay with their current advisor, even though that advisor is doing nothing for them, than make a change to a new advisor because they fear change. What you've got to do is get them to understand that change is normal. The absence of change is abnormal and dangerous. Very important. And the final one is enthusiasm. You need to be enthusiastic in front of the room. You need to have energy and passion, and you need to be dynamic. There are natural ways of doing this, and we tap into some of those natural skills that you may already have. But if you're not naturally enthusiastic, there are some techniques you can learn, professional speaking techniques that you can learn, things like vocal variety, things like pacing, pitch, tone, inflection, volume, movement, gestures. There are, there are things that you can learn about how to speak to a room with, in, with greater intensity and greater enthusiasm. Every one of these nine emotions can be learned. And, and I don't mean the emotions themselves can be learned. What I mean is your ability to evoke those emotions. If you hit all nine of these, the people will trip over themselves to work with you. That's a powerful workshop. And by the way, when you get to 50, 60, 70% appointment ratio, 
you have a business model. Now you've got a viable business model, and we can get you there. My job with White Glove is to help you maximize the business results of your workshops. And I've done this for thousands of advisors. So don't misunderstand. This can be very useful. I think this is the final slide. I, I don't know if we should open this up for questions. Lauren, would you like to do that? Is that a good idea? Yeah, that sounds great. We have a few here, it looks like, already. Okay. Um, at the end of the presentation, can we get a copy of the slide presentation email to us? Uh, yeah, that's totally up to you, Lauren. If you want to send that out, that'd be great. I, I have no problem with that at all. Yeah, I am totally fine with that. If you're fine with that, Frank, I will um, sure. plan on doing that. Um, is this being recorded and is the webinar available and the PowerPoint? Yes, this is being recorded. Um, it's going to take me a few, few days to get it edited, but I will send that out as well along with the PowerPoint. How do I get his book? Um, you, you can go to my website if you want. It's maselligroup.com and uh, you can get the book. <laughs> Should the intro be delivered by a person or can we have it pre-recorded? The intro, somebody's going to introduce you before you get up in front of the room. That's an ideal circumstance. Not every advisor can do that. But that would be another person, somebody who introduces you the way Lauren introduced me briefly in front of the room. But if you're talking about the power opening, the power opening should be you. Do, do not pre-record the power opening. Deliver it live in front of the room. And if you need help doing that, just reach out to me. I'll, I'll help you build this. And we'll make it simple. You don't need to overthink it. It's, an actually, it's actually a very simple strategy. So, yeah, you need to do the power opening. But if you're going to be introduced, somebody else needs to be the introducer. Thank you so much for joining us today. And look for my email. Thanks, everybody.